Hello and welcome to The Spectator Out Loud. Each week we ask a handful of writers to read their pieces from the magazine aloud. This week we have Lloyd Evans arguing that the state should stop subsidising the National Theatre and start funding Britain's bingo halls. Then we have Lionel Shriver on the difficulties of taking back control. And finally... Will Heaven on the Dissolution of the Downside Monastery. First up, Lloyd Evans. For nearly six months, our subsidised playhouses, notably the National Theatre, have been dark. What have we missed? Not much. Some would say nothing at all. And this has come as a surprise to those of us who were led to believe that the subsidised theatre is critical to the national conversation. It turns out that the nation can happily debate political and social issues without the help of playwrights or actors. Perhaps it's time to re-examine our state-funded theatres and the reasons we support them. The National Theatre was set up in 1963, soon after the establishment of the Royal Shakespeare Company in 1961, and both received funding from the Arts Council, which was founded in 1946. The leaders of these august bodies had a particular reverence for drama, opera, ballet and orchestral music, and they assumed, perhaps a little arrogantly, that their preferences were a force for good and that culture could improve humanity. That theory is still active today. The website of the beleaguered old Vic proclaims that every time a theatre closes, we lose a chance to make the world better. But is there any evidence for this commonly held belief? What role did the theatre play in the development of the bicycle or the polio vaccine or the internet? Which theatre makers contributed to the D-Day landings, the fall of the Berlin Wall or the Good Friday Agreement? You could say these examples are irrelevant because actors and dramatists don't fight wars or invent things. The theatre is a public platform where ideas can be exchanged and, at its best, It offers a particularly valuable type of discursive drama, the State of the Nation play. The National Theatre specialises in this genre. Stuff Happens by David Hare in 2004 examined the Iraq War. England People Very Nice in 2009 by Richard Beam chronicled race relations in Britain. And This House in 2012 by James Graham looked at the Labour administration in the 1970s. What these plays lacked, of course, was any sense of urgency or topicality, and that's inevitable. The National Theatre commissions a new script about a year in advance of the first night, so a political play is bound to feel dated by the time it reaches the stage. In 2018, David Hare's drama, I'm Not Running, looked at a fictional leadership contest between two centre-right Labour politicians, but it completely ignored the ascendancy of Jeremy Corbyn and his hard-left allies. So the play seemed detached from reality, and it undermined the idea that a state-of-the-nation drama helps us to understand ourselves. The best political shows at the National offer nothing more than a nostalgic, backward glance at recent history. The rest of its output is a mishmash of high-minded amusements for older and more affluent audiences in London. And the country at large pays for these frolics through taxation. So it's very convenient for the National that so many people still accept that drama is a civilising force. But negative consequences flow from this theory. The Arts Council seems to believe that black and ethnic minorities need exposure to the white theatrical tradition. It readily funds productions of plays by white authors performed by non-white actors. Death of a Salesman by Arthur Miller was produced at the Young Vic in 2019 with an exclusively black cast. And yet the Arts Council makes no reciprocal attempt to get white people into minority cultural genres. There's no funding for white school kids to perform rap or jazz. You won't find all-white reggae bands receiving public money. Where are the grants for white-only drama groups to perform scenes from the Bhagavad Gita or the Arabian Nights? The traffic all moves in one direction. White drama, often rather tedious stuff, is performed by black or brown people. This quietly affirms the primacy of white culture and assigns a lower rank to other artistic traditions. Perhaps, in the light of the lockdown, we should admit a few home truths. First, the national conversation is not an exclusive property of the theatre. Secondly, the dramatic arts are unlikely to make the world a better place. 
Finally, the National Theatre is not an essential public service. It's a luxury, and its £18 million annual grant should be diverted towards cultural pursuits that genuinely help the community and whose advantages are measurable. Numerous creative professions might receive state aid. Children's entertainers, stand-up comedians, bell ringers, skiffle bands, reading groups, bridge clubs, beekeeping fraternities, poetry circles and debating societies. I would argue for three particular activities, barge ownership, gardening and bingo. The East London Canal Network, near my home, is full of exquisitely decorated narrowboats and barges. The finest of these are certainly works of art. Barges offer social as well as aesthetic benefits. A barge is a low-cost, energy-efficient home. Barges support businesses like floating bookshops or waterborne cafes. Mooring fees help to maintain a national system of waterways which teem with wildlife. Youngsters who live on barges acquire skills in navigation, mechanics and boat maintenance, and they learn to tolerate their barge mates' living habits and to embrace the virtues of acceptance and forgiveness. Gardening certainly deserves to be recognised as an official part of our culture. The word culture means growth. A gardener, like any visual artist, must develop a sense of beauty, harmony and colour. He becomes an expert in the science of botany and he can pass this knowledge on to others. He learns the spiritual benefits of exercise, hard work and deferred gratification. And when his garden blooms, it gives visitors a sense of calmness and mental well-being. Finally, bingo. At first sight, a game of bingo seems a long way from the activities currently favoured by the Arts Council. But the connection is very close. Bingo is a live theatrical event with a surprise ending, which rewards the spectators emotionally. It does the same job as Hamlet or Oedipus. Hamlet is a dramatic quest to identify the king's murderer and to placate the gods of vengeance by punishing the offender. Oedipus is a dramatic quest to discover why the gods are angry with the city of Thebes. Bingo is a dramatic quest to find a secret link between a member of the crowd and the goddess of fortune. That's why people love Bingo. It has the satisfying story arc of a courtroom drama or a detective mystery. It starts with a puzzle and moves through a process of inquiry towards an answer that provides delight and relief. It has other benefits. Bingo is a social event which strengthens the ties of communities and families. It helps the economy as well. Each player contributes a small fee, which would not otherwise have been spent. The total sum is handed over to a prize winner, who is likely to splash out on luxuries and gifts, which boost local businesses, and the government collects its share in sales taxes as well. By coincidence, all three of these activities could be accommodated on the banks of the Thames, where the National Theatre now stands. A boatyard might be constructed for barges to be assembled and repaired, the terrace roofs of the National would be ideal for public gardens and the Olivier could become a bingo hall. That was Lloyd Evans. Next, Lionel Shriver. I sympathised with Leave voters who yearned to take back control of British borders. After all, if being a country means anything, it surely entails first and foremost a clear understanding of who comes under that country's protection and who doesn't. Otherwise, a country is just a patch on a map. Yet I've always found Leaver's high hopes for reduced immigration heartbreaking. Cutting ties with the EU was never going to limit migrants apt to put the greatest pressure on British borders this century. Immigrants from outside the EU, especially from high birth rate countries in Africa and the Middle East, who, absent an unlikely new agreement by the end of the Brexit transition period, will only be more difficult to return to the continent. Back in 1984, the editorial board of America's right-leaning Wall Street Journal argued for a five-word constitutional amendment. There shall be open borders. But such outright support for goodie bags brimming with bottled water and welcome to the USA coffee mugs on the American side of the Rio Grande is rare. Two years ago, even the journal backtracked on open borders when the board couldn't stick the reality of what they'd been inviting. A rowdy caravan of more than 7,000 overwhelmingly unskilled, impoverished Hondurans teeming towards Texas. The left will often gesture limply towards controlled immigration. 
while advocating policies that so reward violating immigration statutes and that so tie the hands of immigration authorities that the position amounts to open borders in all but name. These days, leftists perceive any enforcement of immigration law as racist. Alas, among conservatives, we often see a parallel disingenuousness. Center-right politicians make rhetorical noises about sending illegal immigrants packing, while never addressing the primary pull factors. Frustrated by bureaucratic impotence, civil servant incompetence, endless legal gambits and appeals, they conspicuously fail to put deportations where their mouths are. Behold, open borders in all but name. During this year's mini-deluge of some 5,500 unauthorized migrants crossing the English Channel in small boats, though I foretell, you ain't seen nothing yet, The Home Secretary, Priti Patel, has clearly been making an effort, but to little effect. Since January last year, the UK has sent all of 155 boat people back to Europe. So we can share the poor woman's exasperation that when 23 illegal migrants were all set to be flown back to Spain last week, the Home Office was hit by what in cyberspace is called a denial-of-service attack, a maelstrom of last-minute legal actions by, said Patel, lefty labor-supporting lawyers. All 23 amateur seafarers remain ensconced in Britain without having collected any air miles. Once migrants land in Kent, whose facilities for migrant children are full to bursting and whose funds for such services are dry, New arrivals are in like Flynn, and they know it. In smartphone world, our tourists for life are better informed about immigration law and about what to expect or even demand on arrival than their own taxpayer-financed lawyers. The odd poor student is brought up to speed pronto by a phalanx of NGO worthies whose driving purpose is to thwart unfriendly immigration policies and who coach refugees on what to say. That's why Patel wants to introduce a new rule to prevent asylum applicants from adding different grounds for refugee status later in the process. Chartered deportation flights cost a mint. Last year, 12,000 pounds per deportee. And you thought BA was steep. That figure excludes the vast resources required to fight endless court battles. Two or three years ago, during a protest intended to block the return of a woman from Zimbabwe, I noted that she'd been turned down for asylum in Britain seven times. Yep, there she was on the news, still in London. Those seven denials don't merely imply bother. They imply money. Each case can take years as well, allowing migrants to have children or marry and then claim a right to family life. Further, we've established a feedback loop. Every time an ambitious cross-channel kayaker secures free housing and health care, a little allowance, and a job on the black market, all without getting wet, Our successful adventurer effectively sends wish-you-were-here postcards to multiple friends and relatives. Every additional relative means still more relatives get permission to stay because they have a relative in the UK. Brought in by allied nations justifiably guilt-ridden about not having taken in enough Jews fleeing the Nazis, the post-war asylum system is now widely abused. Only in the past few years have I even heard the expression illegal immigrant in the UK. Before then, every uninvited visitor was an asylum seeker. However well migrants have read up on the convincing reasons to claim asylum, the chances that a majority of Europe's purported asylum seekers are actually escaping persecution are slight. Said widespread abuse, 
reduces the chances that genuinely persecuted applicants are given the green light. But little matter. Most failed applicants aren't going anywhere. Western immigration enforcement is drowning in due process. It's too costly, too complicated, and too hard. In some, it's a farce. The deck is powerfully stacked against the state because the state has stacked the deck against itself. Highly complex systems are easy to game, and that's assuming illegal arrivals even bother to game them. Word to the wise. Never trust immigration figures. Those are only the people the government knows about. Good luck to Ms. Patel with overhauling asylum law in her Fair Borders bill slated for later this year. But I hope she forgives my cynicism. The Home Office's history on immigration is chaotic and ineffectual, as well as arbitrary, for the Department has sometimes chosen to put its foot down with the most deserving. See Windrush. One bit of advice, pretty. Offshore asylum applications, if you can. Because the moment migrants physically set foot in your country, they're your problem. Still, I'm not holding my breath for Britain taking back control of its borders anytime soon. That was Lionel Shriver. And finally, Will Heaven. The monks of Downside Abbey in Somerset elected a new abbot last Thursday, according to 6th century rules laid down by St Benedict. The next day, they sent an email notification saying they had voted to make a new start and to seek a new place to live. It was a shock to those who know the place. The monks will leave behind a beautiful abbey church built in the Gothic revival style. It's a 166-foot tower visible for miles around. A monastery in cloisters, the largest monastic library in Britain, and a grand-looking public school with more than 300 pupils. It's as if a piece of English Catholicism, like a decaying chunk of church masonry, has fallen away. But it has been a long time coming. So many of the monks I knew while at school at Downside in the early 2000s, some of them towering figures it seemed at the time, have died or left already. Some with their reputations intact, others with their lives in ruins. One is now a priest in a thriving American parish. Another is in Rome. A former abbot quit entirely and got married to one of the school nurses. For the handful of mostly elderly monks left, the decision to leave cannot have been easy. They will have prayed from dawn till dusk. They know that there were enormous failings which allowed child abuse to take place in the school for decades. The guilty men, as in other Catholic settings, were then wrongly protected by the institution. An unwavering deference from lay Catholics towards them helped, but it was the bonds of loyalty between the monks themselves that led to disaster. These bonds were almost always prized over the safety of the boys in their care. By definition, monks aren't worldly, but their political naivety and stubbornness in the past few years backfired badly. About eight years ago, when historic abuse at Downside was unearthed, there were calls, including from me, for the school and monastery to separate formally. They were owned by a single charitable trust, and all the trustees were monks who held the purse strings and therefore called the shots even after a lay headmaster was appointed. I argued my case for separation on a visit to the school and was told by a monk that they would resist such a confiscation. This was surely a mistake. Had they managed the overdue reforming of the school's governance with a little more foresight and humility, long before several of them appeared in the dock at Theresa May's independent inquiry into child sexual abuse, things might have been different. Nevertheless, 
The monk's decision to leave is a bold move and the right one now, guided by an outsider, the new abbot brought in from Belmont Abbey. They have put lay Catholics in charge of the school and finally set it free at great financial cost. During the splitting of the single trust into separate school and monastery trusts, Renaissance paintings were dusted off and sold at Sotheby's, including a Bernardo Zanale depiction of St John the Baptist that went for £225,000. It may not work in the long term. St Mary's Shaftesbury, a West Country Catholic girls' school where a few of my friends' wives went, has recently shut down after too many loss-making years in a row. But it is well worth trying. Downside, for all its faults, remains hugely popular with current parents, their sons and daughters, and former pupils who visit, especially at Easter and for wonderful midnight masses at Christmas. One American alumnus recently gave a million dollars for bursaries. That's pocket money to a school like Eton, but a significant sign here of faith in the future. The monks will also see this move in a wider context and weather it for that reason. They are really a migrant community, founded in exile in Dowie, Flanders, in 1606, where they trained priests for the English mission, two of whom were martyred and made saints. As an English monastic house with a small college, they were forced to flee back to England after the French Revolution, finding lodgings with a former pupil in Shropshire, until they bought a farmhouse at Downside in 1814. To begin with, the chapel they built there was a disguise to the outside world, with no distinguishing features. The Somerset locals were wary of these strange newcomers in their black habits, But in the decades after Catholic emancipation, the monks began to assert themselves, building the abbey, described by Pevsner as the most splendid demonstration of the renaissance of Roman Catholicism in England, and buying hundreds of acres more land. The school began to prosper and resemble its non-Catholic rivals, such as Sherburne and Winchester. There is no question that especially in the second half of the 20th century, there was what one former monk called a heart of darkness at Downside, despite its outward signs of success and the positive experience of so many pupils like me. It has been a painful decade, especially for the victims of abuse, and, I would add, those monks who were good men trying to live their vocations faithfully but it feels as if the light is finally breaking through. That was Will Heaven. Thank you for listening to this week's edition of Spectator Out Loud. And if you enjoyed this, why not consider watching Spectator TV? Each week, Andrew Neil hosts The Week in 60 Minutes, alongside an assortment of Spectator writers and guests. You can tune in next week on Thursday at 6 o'clock. Go to www tv.spectator.co.uk We hope to see you there.